everybody. Welcome to the first evening of the fifth season of the Local History, Local Novelist series. And if you didn't get them, there are flyers on the display case over there for the next event and also for um, the whole series, which runs from October to May. Um, next month, um, there's the November 5th. Um, it's, we're having a reading from the book Paradise Found, which is a really gorgeous um, new book of, of art and poetry about Northampton um, with a lot of really wonderful readers. That should be fun. And December 3rd um, is a celebration of local novelists with Michelle Barker, Suzanne strimpic Dina Friedman, and Karen Shepard. But um, look at the flyer for the whole list. And tonight is something different than we, anything we've ever done before. It's strange stories of science, bugs, scandal, and fiction. So, which I've, I've had such fun with all those exclamation points since we, we planned this, this evening. Um, the premise of the local history, local novelist series is that the depth, courage, and insight with which we engage with history is strongly shaped by the depth, courage, and insight with which we engage with stories, and that's all stories. So tonight we have three approaches to science that I imagine will be very different in tone. Faith Deering is talking to us about a tiny insect which secretes a resin that eventually becomes shellac. And I hear that she's uncovered fascinating local history in the course of her research. Um, and I can't, I really hope that she tells us about that because um, she's been, I've been dying to hear it and she won't tell me. Um, Peter Koble is discussing his biography of a world renowned researcher on lemurs. And the, the, the path of that, life path of that researcher went seriously awry. And his book strikes me as, among other things, a story that is very much of the mid 20th century, especially the 70s. And Brian Adams has written a comic take on climate change, arguably the most urgent issue of our time. The so one thing that all three speakers have in common is that their stories remind us that human culture is deeply intertwined with the lives and the very survival of other species. So, oh, and I just want to mention too, so you know, that um, NCTV is filming tonight as, as they do um, all of the events uh, in our series. So Faith Deering is a museum educator in historic Deerfield's Department of Museum Education. Before coming to Deerfield, she worked at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History as an entomologist. She is a world traveler who has been to Thailand, Senegal, Central America, and Europe in search of insects. One of Faith's strong interests is making connections between the natural world and human cultural history. From honeybees to silkworms, from shellac scale to cochineal dye, Faith enjoys talking about the myriad roles insects play in people's lives. And I've been wanting to bring Faith in to be part of this series for a long time because I share her conviction that there are powerful things to be learned from considering the part of a natural world that consists of insects and spiders. Faith Deering. Thank you, Susan. I'm glad to be here. And I'm the bugs part of the program. I didn't bring my net or my field vest, but here I am. And my talk is glossing over history, the little bug that makes things shine. Pick up an apple in the grocery store, one that is shiny and a little waxy to the touch. Munch on a silky smooth junior mint. Take a time release capsule for a stomach disorder. Run your hand over the silky grain of a highly polished wooden table. Put on your favorite felt hat that has maintained its shape 
over the years. Each of these actions, though seemingly unrelated, brings you in contact with a shared common product created by a bug. The product, shellac. The bug, a minute scale insect, the lac scale, Caria lacca. This tiny bug is the subject of my remarkable tale, a story that spans centuries, crosses continents and cultures, links past to present and ancient lore to local history right here. My introduction to shellac and the scale insect came about as the result of an invitation to join a Smithsonian research group growing, going to Thailand in 2005 to study shellac and the insect that produces it. My role on this expedition was to document the cultural aspects of shellac production. This suited me perfectly, and Susan, you stole a few words from my talk here. As an entomologist, my strong interest is cultural entomology, which means our human connections with the insect world. So think silk and silkworms, bees, honey, and wax, cochineal and red dye, and then there are the bad ones, fleas and the plague, mosquitoes and malaria, you understand the beneficials and the pests. Insects and humans, we are inextricably linked. We write about them, sing about them, put them in our art, eat them, and use their products. To get back to my story, and all stories need a good beginning, this one begins with the fascinating life history of the lac scale. Scale is a perfect name for a group of insects that produce waxy, or depending on the species, armored scales as a protective covering for their soft bodies. Scale insects are tiny, one to three millimeters in length, and extraordinarily diverse in appearance. Some scales look like seashells, Others resemble tiny tufts of cotton. Still others appear to be nothing more than shiny red globules. And that's the scale insect, a red glob. All scale insects begin life as an egg laid on a specific plant by a legless, wingless female scale insect. The males, they have legs, they have wings, they fly around, but those females just sit in one place. The very tiny, tiny little wee nymphs that emerge from the eggs are known as crawlers, because that's what they do, crawl around rapidly on a branch, looking for a place to pierce the plant tissue with their sharp beak-like mouths. Once they do this, they stay in place, plugged in, sucking nutrition from the plant and often causing death of new plant growth. This feeding behavior is what gets most scaled insects labeled as pests. Many scales feed on only one kind of plant. There's the cottony cushion scale that feeds on citrus trees, a lilac oyster shell scale, you can imagine what that looks like, and the one that's killing our hemlock trees, the woolly adelgid. That's also a scale insect. Lac scales have to feed on specific trees native to Southeast Asia. This tree is called the rain tree. And instead of being considered a damaging pest, lac scales are purposely placed on rain tree branches where they produce a harvestable crop that can be processed into shellac. The tiny, tiny little soft scale insects clump together to feed on tree sap. As they feed, they exude a sticky, resinous substance that builds up layer upon layer, hardening and forming a shell around them. You can see, and I have a little table of show and tell over there, so later on, see, it's very hard. This hard shell acts as a protective covering for the vulnerable scales. This is the shell over the lac, hence the name shellac. The resin also acts as a glue, helping the scales to adhere to the branch as they feed. Many, many deposits of this natural, 
resinous polymer cover an entire branch and finally cover an entire tree. In the rain tree plantations of Thailand, the crawlers are placed on the branches by lac farmers who maintain the trees and their lac colonies with care and careful pruning. Harvesting begins in late November when lac covered limbs are cut off the trees, gathered into piles, and sold to local factories as stick lac. So this would be stick lac. I visited a lac factory in northern Thailand. The factory was a busy, noisy place filled with many Rube Goldberg type of machines. During a multi-step and very noisy process that involves everything from hand sorting, so people were working in the factory, to huge hoppers where stick lac is scraped and chopped, to giant vats where the lac, now called seed lac, is washed. The washing rinses out a natural red pigment called lachaic acid. The result of all this processing is shellac in the form of flakes or granules or powder. Shellac in any of these forms can be dissolved in denatured alcohol for use on furniture and other wood products or dissolved in ethyl alpha alcohol to use as a food safe coating. So the liquid shellac that you buy in a can, zinzer shellac, just like this, is the powdered lac scale dissolved in denatured alcohol. Powdered shellac dissolved in ethyl alcohol, the form of alcohol that we drink, is a food safe natural product used as a coating on fruits, as a glaze on candy, in the pharmaceutical industry for coating pills. In the food industry, it's called confectioner's glaze. So, if you have any shiny candies, particularly chocolate, and you want to check out what's making them so shiny, just look for confectioner's glaze. The fact that shellac is a natural product and edible is key to understanding its very early history, a history that begins with the use of shellac for medicinal purposes. Lac and lachaic acid, the red pigment I mentioned, were highly valued as medicines as well as dye. You know, in ancient times, a red dye that had sustaining power was, was very powerful. And let me tell you, this is full of red dye. At some point during the hundreds of years that lac was used primarily as a pigment, its value as a glossy preservative finish was recognized. The exchange of goods along the Silk Road brought shellac and its byproducts into contact with Europeans. By 1534, there were detailed descriptions written down about the cultivation, harvesting, processing, and use of lac as a wood finish. European use of lac increased during the Renaissance as it gained popularity for use on fine furniture. By the mid 17th century, Shellac resin and shellac wax were used with increasing frequency by painters to create a, pro a protective finish on their masterpieces. And stationers and people who were writing with quill pens used shellac as a component of sealing wax. That's what makes it stick. By the 18th century, shellac was the coating of choice for furniture, wood carvings, and wood turnings. In the early 19th century, lac processing plants were being built throughout Europe. In these factories, seed lac coming from India and Thailand was made into shellac. The first shellac processing factory in the United States opened in New York City in 1849. As processed shellac became available in the United States, it was used by cabinet makers and joiners to impart a deep, resinous glow to their finished work. However, the unique quality of shellac and its ability to be heated and then molded made it appealing to inventors and entrepreneurs who were trying to produce a hard, durable material with a shine, one that would be protective, easy to manufacture, and relatively inexpensive to make. Now, the need for this kind of a material rose out of many different things, especially 
out of the popularity of a new type of photograph, the daguerreotype. Daguerreotypes were invented by a French man, Jean-Louis Daguerre, in 1839. They were small, remarkably detailed, photographed images produced on highly polished silver plates of copper. I think you might have seen them, just little wee things and very, very, very shiny. The daguerreotype process revolutionized photography, making it possible for individuals to have an affordable, one-of-a-kind image produced quickly. Not only that, but daguerreotypes were small enough to be held in the hand as well as displayed at home. They were very appealing and very popular, but very fragile. Contact with any object could cause scratching of the image. Even the salt and moisture from a quick touch would leave a fingerprint. It became clear that daguerreotypes needed further protection, protection from some sort of a case. The first cases were made of wood, often covered with thin sheets of leather or velvet. These were lovely, but not protective enough. Something more durable was needed. Now we're bringing shellac back here. Enter two New England entrepreneurs, Alfred P. Critchlow of Florence, Massachusetts, and Samuel Peck of Waterbury, Connecticut. Both men were inventors who saw a developing market for a better daguerreotype case and the potential for using shellac as a material for creating this case. Peck called his material union. Critchlow called his Florence compound, naming it after the town he lived in. Compound or union, both names refer to the material construction of the cases. The union of the, comp of the components, shellac, wood fiber, some chemicals I haven't been able to track down, and dye for coloring the cases. They were often black, from lamp black, or a deep reddish brown. When these components were mixed together, heated and pressed into a mold, the parts of a union case were made. They were perfectly hinged and lined with satin. Each case was specifically designed to hold a precious, fragile daguerreotype and nothing else, a case for one purpose. The composition material they were made of came to be called thermoplastic now recognized as one of the earliest forms of plastic. Critchlow and Peck both founded companies to make their daguerreotype cases. Critchlow's company, A.P. Critchlow and Company in Florence, was soon making thousands of cases in many decorative designs in order to keep up with the ever-increasing demand for daguerreotypes. When the popularity of union cases was reaching its peak in 1857, Critchlow sold his interest in the company and its name was changed to Littlefield Parsons and Company. However, as we know so well, the field of photography is constantly changing. Just think how quickly we've gone from our precious photography albums, our photograph albums full of beautiful photos to digital images, those digital images that we look at only on our iPhones. Photography was changing just as rapidly in the mid-1800s. A new invention, carte de visite, made daguerreotypes outdated, and union cases were no longer needed. Carte de visite were photographs printed on paper. Many copies could be printed at one time. They were easy to mail and far less fragile than silver and copper daguerreotypes. So, no more need for those cases. Littlefield Parsons and Company saw sales of their cases drop dramatically as carte de visite became more and more popular. What to do? They had tools and machinery in place to manufacture shellac-based Florence compound so they searched for something else to manufacture. The answer they came up with was brushes, hair brushes. And to accompany them, hand mirrors for women. 
And actually, they made many, many kinds of brushes, clothing brushes, um, lots and lots of brushes. The back of the brush and its handle and reverse side of the mirror were molded from Florence compound, our thermoplastic. The same pressed mold technique with a decorative pattern that was used in the union case making was used to make the brushes. By 1866, the company reorganized and changed its name to Florence Manufacturing Company. In 1924, with the addition of toothbrush manufacturing, the company again changed names, this time to Prophylactic Brush Company, shortened to ProBrush. We all know about good old ProBrush. The Pro Brush of Florence that became so famous for its toothbrushes. So, Susan, a buggy piece of local history <laughs> that takes us from Thailand to Florence, from shellac to thermoplastic, from union cases to toothbrushes, all because of a tiny bug that makes things shine. So, in one last piece. On your way out, I happen to know there are refreshments in the back, but you can pick up a small box of milk dug chocolates. <laughs> Covered with silky smooth <laughs> confectioner's glaze. And then, Go home and brush your teeth with a pro <laughs> brush. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> and I don't know about you, I was having all these images of my, all these empty jewel cases for my CDs. I've got boxes full now of those empty jewel cases. You might have all been holding daguerreotypes, right? Yeah. yeah. So. Peter Kobel is the author of The Strange Case of the Mad Professor, a true tale of endangered species, illegal drugs, and attempted murder, published by Lions Press last year. I'll let Peter himself tell you the wild true story that this biography unfolds. Um, Peter is a longtime journalist who has worked as an editor at such magazines as Art News, Entertainment Weekly, Saveur, and Premier, and has contributed articles to the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune. His previous book, Silent Movies, The Birth of Film, and the Triumph of Movie Culture, was written in collaboration with the Library of Congress. In recent years, Peter has worked in communications at several nonprofit organizations in support of environmental causes. A recent transplant to Northampton, he teaches public relations at Springfield College and creative nonfiction writing at Hampshire County Jail. Peter. Thank you, Susan. That was amazing, Faith. Very nice. Hard to follow. Um, this is my book, and I mainly brought it in case I have a senior moment while I'm talking. This is going to be a little more off the cuff. Uh, I have a background in journalism, and I am a nonfiction writer. I say that because I need to emphasize this is nonfiction. I'm going to start by telling you the story, the, in brief, of uh, my subject. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about the challenges I faced in writing a book about John Bittner Janisch. And so, uh, it's... Can like a little bit? It's tough to hear you in the back. Okay. It takes two hands. Yeah. It does. Can I manage it? Yeah. How's that? Is that better? I think so. A little more. Okay. Can you hear me now? So I'm here for the scandal part of the evening. Uh, I hope you're not disappointed. John Bittner Janish was uh, a paradox. He was uh, brilliant, uh, arrogant, uh, charismatic, flamboyant, 
physical anthropologist. And he started in a small town in northern Wisconsin. Few prospects, middle of nowhere. He kind of stood out because he was a bit weird and a bit of a narcissist and liked to attract attention. He went on to uh, University of Chicago and then to UMich, got his degree, uh, got a big break, got a job at Yale as an assistant professor in anthropology. Uh, in the early 60s, he started going to Madagascar and he started bringing back lemurs to Yale. There really wasn't any place to keep them, so as he brought more and more back, they were spread out over various buildings, and graduate students would take care of them and feed them. He didn't exactly, he certainly didn't put Madagascar on the map. Uh, explorers from Europe had been going there uh, in the 1700s and 1800s, great age of natural history exploration. And they'd been brought back to Europe, and uh, people knew about them. But no one had really, was, no one was really studying them until BJ, as his friends and enemies, as he was called by everyone, so they didn't have to pronounce Bittner Janish, uh, brought the creatures back encouraged his students and colleagues to study them and kept bringing them back so that he had a collection of a couple hundred which Yale was getting a little impatient because they had no place to put them. The critters would occasionally escape there would be a hoo-ha in the local paper, the New Haven Register. Um, lemurs want to be free. He was, he had, he was good at making friends, he was good at making enemies, and he had a number of enemies at Yale. And after six years, which is, you know, your time is up if you're going for a tenure, um, you get three years, and then you get another three years, and then they vote, and you're either there or you're not. And he didn't get tenure, so he took his lemurs and moved to Duke. And at Duke, he created what is today the, um, the largest collection of lemurs in captivity outside of Madagascar, the Duke Lemur Center. It's an amazing place. That was sort of my entrance into the story. I'm not a scientist. I'm not an academic. Uh, I've had a lifelong entrance, uh, interest in uh, environmentalism and conservation. Uh, and my Visiting the Duke Lemur Center just transformed uh, my, my um, whole idea about um, conservation in a way. Uh, briefly, I mean, we know lemurs. We know um, they, they've become so iconic since uh, DreamWorks trilogy, Madagascar, came out. Um, ringtail lemurs are the real almost symbol of Madagascar. Um, while the center prospered, um, BJ got more and more impatient with after his experience at Yale, Duke in the 70s was kind of in a backwater, at least from BJ's point of view. 
and he, he was, as soon as he got there, he wanted to leave. And he was a flamboyant character, a real uh, dresser. Um, he, and this was unusual in the 60s and 70s in the South. He dyed his hair, uh, kind of shocking, platinum blonde, um, wore really outrageous suits and ties. Uh, you know, he, he wanted to be a spectacle. He wanted to attract attention. He had an, what some people, you would call a narcissist personality. But it was a kind of narcissism that moved from being self-centered to narcissistic, borderline personality to sociopath. He uh, finally got out of the South and became department chair at NYU and um, as he told uh, his good friend Michael Coe at Yale, uh, really uh, another really brilliant writer who's written a lot of popular books on Mayan civilizations, uh, the Mayan civilization. Um, he boasted that he would have dictatorial powers and uh, it's, that's absurd. I mean, he, he became a department chair, the chair of anthropology at NYU. Yes, you um, are you know, responsible for whether someone gets a good raise or not. Uh, you don't really get to hire or fire. Um, but he did become a little dictator. And when he arrived in uh, New York, it was a really tumultuous time in the 70s. Uh, most of you in this room remember the 70s. Uh, in many ways, the 60s carried over into the 70s. And the 70s in New York, New York was really going through a very hard time. Uh, it was kind of horrific. The, nothing worked. Uh, there were tens of thousands of heroin addicts. Uh, poverty uh, was, you know, poverty is still widespread in New York, but uh, it was just very apparent. It seemed like this city was falling apart. And you might remember the famous headline um, when President Ford uh, declined to give New York City a bailout. Um, it was just pretty horrible. In this horrible place, uh, where things just seem to be crumbling. NYU is this little bastion in downtown Manhattan. And even among the eccentrics in academia, uh, BJ stood out. He began to stand out in, a, in very odd ways. Um, the oddest way was this man who had distinguished himself became the foremost uh, expert on lemurs in the world, had encouraged these people to study them in Madagascar, and behind the scientists came the conservationists. He, um, the National Science Foundation, for the first time in a couple decades, had declined to give him his uh, grants, and he was an angry man, he decided he would make up for that by turning his campus lab into a drug factory, and he started making LSD and quaaludes. Quaaludes were the popular drug in the late 70s. LSD was kind of becoming popular again. And he not only did that, he got his students to make the drugs, some of them knowingly, some of them not. So the FBI became involved, they started um, getting students to wear wiretaps. BJ was arrested. He was convicted at a jury trial. He went to federal prison camp in Florida for making and distributing drugs. He said he was making the drugs to experiment on lemurs. There were no lemurs, but um, that was the plan. 
So uh, he got out of federal prison camp is minimum security. It's like the uh, place where they sent Martha Stewart in Connecticut. And it's where, it's where they send white collar criminals. He got out and he was amazed that he couldn't get a job. No one would hire him. Not only had he made drugs on a, in a campus lab, he had gotten students to help him, corrupting the young. Um, he got angrier and angrier, and he went back to the East Village, where NYU is in downtown Manhattan, and uh, became kind of a ghost. He was the toast of the town before. Flamboyant, gave great parties, big spender. Um, he was just kind of like crashing on people's couches. After a few years, this is now in the mid-80s, he decided that he was going to kill the federal judge who sentenced him. It was a jury trial. The judge didn't even decide that he was guilty. He sent poisoned uh, chocolates to the judge on Valentine's Day. And um, in a Godiva box, he made the chocolates himself. And uh, he also sent them to uh, the man, the former chair at Yale, who didn't give him tenure, to a former student, then a professor, who hadn't credited him with a byline on a paper for research done in his lab. He, he was an angry man. The, the judge, judge didn't taste the candies. The judge's wife did and became violently ill, nearly died, was in critical condition for three days. He left a fingerprint on the, one of the Godiva boxes. And once again, the feds caught him. This time, he did real time. He went to um, Supermax prison in a place called Marion, Illinois. Um, so that's the scandal part. How do you, as a writer, it was a huge challenge for me because of the um, cognitive dissonance of the cute, cuddly lemurs, everybody's favorite primate, and this terrible story about an awful man who, unfortunately, I, after researching it, I went in with an open mind. I concluded was a psychopath, with zero empathy, nice to the people he liked, cruel to the people he didn't, um, indifferent to the fate of the students who became involved in the whole drug thing. How to combine those things? I actually look to fiction uh, for some ideas. Uh, I read a lot of campus novels, which I like. Uh, some of you may know them. Uh, there are so many good ones. David Lodge's Campus Trilogy, uh, Jane Smiley's Moo, Don DeLillo's White Noise. They're kind of satirical, they're kind of fun. So I tried to create scenes with the infighting in academia um, that lent the book that air before you get to the hard parts. Another way I did it was taking in each chapter using um, a different character who's, and character in quotes, these are real people, uh, a different character looking at BJ. Um, in one of the early chapters, one of, set at Yale, one of his grad students, who went on to become a really uh, terrific scientist and writer, Alison Jolly, who just died last year, um, wrote a wonderful book, Lords and Lemurs. Uh, her experiences with BJ at Yale and then in Madagascar and doing her own research. And in the South at Duke, uh, another sci fellow scientist, Peter Klopfer, a uh, Quaker, uh, wonderful man, really idealistic, good friend to BJ even while he was in Supermax, um, realized his flaws, but remain loyal to him as a friend. And that also helped to uh, take some of the sting out of the story 
and tie it together. Uh, I wanted to, I, I, I realized, right, you know, very soon, BJ was indeed guilty. Many of his friends claimed he was framed for uh, the whole drug, in the drug trial. Everyone says he went crazy at the end uh, from being unjustly convicted according to his friends or just, you know, not being in the limelight. Um, I wanted to leave people with not the feeling that you know, what BJ did uh, wasn't wrong, but to be able to see that despite his tremendous flaws, despite what I consider great accomplishments, making, helping the world recognize that Madagascar is a serious conservation hotspot, lemurs are dangerous, lemurs are in danger, um, he was a flawed human being. And I actually came to dislike him as I was um, finishing the book. And that, that made it a, a little tough, but if you can understand someone, you don't necessarily have to forgive them. But to see people as human beings, I think is, uh, a good writer's goal. That's it. Thank you very much. A writer's goal, a historian's goal, right? I mean, it's very interesting. And I have, I just read the book. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to ask you some questions about his motivation, right? <laughs> but um, so, Brian Adams is the author of Love in the Time of Climate Change, which is going to be released October 20th. It just went to the printing, printers today, yeah. right? Um, he is a professor of environmental science and the co-chair of the science department of Greenfield Community College, where he was taught for the last 20 years. He's active in the climate change movement on and off, off campus. And Brian writes that he struggled for years with how to get information on climate change out to the world beyond academia, and has, so has felt compelled to tackle impending world catastrophe in fictional form through humor, drugs, social awkwardness, and sex, while being uncompromising about the science of climate change. Brian Adams. Thank you, Susan. Thanks, everyone, for coming. It's a good turnout on a sort of dreary first day of October. Um, there's a lot of funny stuff out there. Uh, insects that make shellac. I mean, bugs in general are just funny. Uh, crazy professors that synthesize acid in their lab and then try to off their professor, their judges with poison chocolates. In a, in a weird, warped, news of the weird way, that's actually quite funny. <laughs> uh, climate change, on the other hand, is not funny at all. There is nothing funny about it. There's not a funny bone in its body, which is why I decided to write a comedy about climate change. There's a relatively new genre of literature out there called cli-fi. Some of you may have heard of it. And for the most part, it's a uh, sort of post-apocalyptic dystopian stuff that sells really well. Um, sort of what happens after the fall, after climate catastrophe, sort of the Hunger Games on steroids kind of stuff, which is really good stuff, but absolutely terrifying. I decided to do something a little bit different and combine cli-fi with rom-com. <laughs> Um, and I think I have the distinction maybe of being the first, or at least one of the first, to write a romantic comedy about climate change. Uh, my novel is called Love in the Time of Climate Change. It's coming out at the end of October, and it went to the printer today. Yes! So I'm psyched about that. The hero of my novel is a community college professor with OCD, obsessive climate disorder. 
He's quirky, socially awkward, adolescent acting, smokes a little too much pot, lusts after one of his students, nothing like me. Um, and the novel chronicles a semester in his teaching life, actually the fall of 2012, as he sort of muddles his way through saving the world um, and desperately seeking true love. I have the great honor of having Bill McKibben, who I think a lot of you know. He's a guru of climate change, author of The End of Nature, founder of 350.org, uh, blurb my book, which I was really, really flattered about. Uh, Bill said, it's a pleasure to meet this fellow sufferer of obsessive climate disorder. He's definitely funnier than most of us environmental types. And that's what I've attempted to do, again, is to sort of tackle potential world catastrophe. Uh, as Susan said, in a fictionalized form that combines drugs and socially awkwardness and humor and sex while being uncompromising about science change. I'm sorry, climate change. I found that so many people avoid reading nonfiction climate change because it's so depressing and absolutely paralyzing. I mean, seriously, how many of you have read climate nonfiction? It's, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to, to read. Extreme weather, food insecurity, drought, wildfires, famine, drowning, polar bears, rising sea levels. You know, ah! I mean, it just goes on and on and on. My hair was actually brown when I started teaching it at GCC. Um, and my thought is that maybe, just maybe, humor and silliness and, and love present this ideal opening, not just for climate activists, but for the general public, um, to read about climate change in a way that is much more, perhaps, um, doable for them. There's no debate about climate change in, in, in the novel. The debate is over. The science is in. Unless you're a right-wing, nutso Republican who gets all your news from Fox or Rush Limbaugh, there is no debate about climate change. Climate change is real. Climate change is happening. It's happening much quicker than we thought it would. The potential consequences are catastrophic. We know who the culprit is, and it is us. And wait for it, there is good news. There's a whole lot that we can do about it. As a professor at GCC, I've really struggled with this. How do I teach students about climate change without them resorting to substance abuse, um, serious depression, uh, sending me poison chocolates? Um, <laughs> or the worst case scenario, doing absolutely nothing. And I struggle with this. You know, how do you give people the facts, teach them the science, lead them, if you will, to the abyss, and then pull them back, give them hope, and motivate them to really get off their asses and do something? If anyone's figured that out, please let me know after the, the show. Um, there's a lot of good news out there. 400,000 of us, I know some of us in this audience, went down to the streets of New York on September 21st, a week and a half ago, for the largest climate demonstration in history, 400,000 of us. I was fortunate to be in one of the 24, I think, buses that went down from uh, Western Massachusetts to be this wonder, part of this wonderful show of solidarity and action and, and, uh, and concern. People were jazzed, people were pumped, people were psyched. Marty Nathan has a wonderful piece in the Gazette, in this morning's Gazette, by the way, if you'd like to read that. It's, she did a nice job of trying to, to synthesize that. We live in this defining moment in history, and 400,000 people showed up on a Sunday to really show that they care, which is just wonderful. Again, there's nothing funny about climate change, but the people who are active in the climate change movement can be really funny. Uh, not all the time, but at least some of it. Progressive movements, movements tend to attract um, interesting characters, uh, just the way the sort of fascist right does. Fortunately, our characters tend to be much more lovable, uh, much less uh, scary, uh, plus we're right and they aren't. Right is incorrect. 
Um, I'd like to, get to read you one scene uh, from my novel. It's hard to pick a five minute thing that captures the flavor of the book, but I'll do my best. One thing you need to know, again, OCD, obsessive climate disorder, which our hero really suffers through. Um, Jesse is his roommate, who's mentioned. They've been, just been shopping at the farmer's market where they picked up a bunch of garlic and two women. Uh, the two women, Patty and Rebecca, are grad students at UMass in Renaissance Studies. Just a quick aside, uh, Patty is here. Patty is my wonderful neighbor across the street. She said, I want to be in your book. I want to be in your book. <laughs> um, so she's not a 20-something Renaissance Studies grad student. Her upstairs tenant is. And one of the fun things about writing fiction is you can use people's names and professions any way you want in ways that have nothing to do with their real character. Um, neither Patty or the upstairs tenant have heard any of this novel, so I hope I don't piss them off too much. But it's done, it's to the printer, it's too late now. <laughs> All right, so a um, couple pages from, from the novel. The twins, they weren't, but they could have been, had a spacious second floor apartment on Federal Street, about a block from the center of town. We sat on their couch. Jesse, clearly taking to heart the market woman's words of wisdom, proceeded to hold forth with garlic still in hand. The two women put on the red hot chili peppers, passed around a quart of fresh apple cider and a killer joint, and gave us a lowdown on the trials and tribulations of Renaissance studies. Gossip and palace intrigue fit for queens and kings. They went off on the relationships between the natural and the supernatural in 16th century England. And the animated discussion about visions, apparitions, miracles, demonic possession, mystical ecstasy reached such a crescendo that Jesse disappeared in the bedroom with Patty. Or was it Rebecca? The pot had not helped in keeping the two of them straight, as it were. I was enjoying myself. What was not to like? They were animated, smart, witty, and cute as hell. I was high, and so were they. Whichever one was left was clearly interested in me. God knows I hadn't had it in a long time. And here it was being handed to me on a silver platter, ripe for the plucking, a feast for a Renaissance king. But just as, Re Re as Rebecca, Patty, moved closer to me and things began to get really interesting, curse and nuisance, blight and bother, my OCD kicked in, big time. The goddamn climate freight chain train came roaring down the tracks. No, I silently screamed to myself, no, not now. From the moment I had walked in their apartment door, I'd done my best to ignore the surroundings and keep my eyes on the prize. Don't go there, I had told myself as I breathed deeply in, through the nose and out, through the mouth, desperate to banish the incoming explosive images from my head. Just close your eyes, close your damn eyes. Don't look around, focus on our beautiful breasts. Screen out the picture of climate chaos that was their apartment. It didn't work. Try as I might, the combination of pot, an unfamiliar setting, and my general anxiety around women had made my climate radar kick into high gear. I was helplessly falling, flailing, unable to stop myself. Be gone, you demons! Out, out, you devils! None of my manful efforts to silence the shrill voice of OCD had any effect. Their apartment was a torture chamber, an inquisitor's toolkit of energy no-nos. Disaster number one, incandescent light bulbs. <laughs> the evil ones, energy sucking little bastards. Their apartment was full of them. Not one lamp had a compact fluorescent or LED bulb and they were all turned on. <laughs> it was the middle of the day and all the lights were on, all of them. Disaster number two, everything else was on. There was a lot of everything else, three computers, two tablets, two Kindles, six digital clocks. The list went on and on. They had every electronic gadget known to humankind, multiple generations of the same gadget. Their apartment was a virtual museum of electronic gadgetry, and they were all turned on, <laughs> all of them. Disaster number three, the heat was blasting, and it was a beautiful September day, and the windows, the windows, for Christ's sake, were wide open. <laughs> I am not making this up. No wonder I was dripping sweat. It was pushing 95 in the apartment and the goddamn heat was on. Disaster number four, the straw that broke the camel's back. 
There they were, lying in plain view for the whole world to see, as God is my witness, recyclables in the trash can. <laughs> and not just recyclables, but returnables. Three beer bottles and a pep Pepsi. Returnables in the friggin' trash can. I desperately tried to focus on twin number one, who was inching, inching ever closer. She had taken off her sweater, and I could see her nipples, hard and erect, pointing through her braless top. Her hand was on my thigh, and her tongue was in my mouth, and I was losing it. I could now hear Jessie and twin number two giggling and frolicking in the back bedroom, oblivious to the living climate hell that was happening here, right here, at this very moment. What was wrong with me? I breathed in and out, out and in, desperate to make my OCD go away, make it stop. Don't be so crazy. Don't think these crazy thoughts. Don't let all this crazy climate crap get in the way of fondling some absolutely fabulous breasts. This was pathological. This was insane. What was wrong with me? Are you OK? Twin number one asked. I think it was Patty. I don't know, I gasped. I think I might have a clove of garlic stuck in my throat. All of a sudden, I feel nauseated. I can't breathe. I need to step outside. I am so sorry. I feel like such a jerk, but I have to get some air. I got up, grabbed my bags of food from the farmer's market, and staggered out the door. <laughs> So um, again, attempting to combine humor with what are, is real science, or at least real um, energy and efficiency, I suppose. Um, I would love for you to buy my book. It doesn't come out until, I think, October 24th. Um, I have a sheet here for people to sign up if you'd like notification. Um, I don't really care whether you read it or not. Just buy it. <laughs> And certainly, I would encourage you not to support this bastion of socialism, free public library. You can get the thing for free. Who came up with that idea? Um, so my book is being published by Green Writers Press, which is kind of a cool, new, relatively new, year old or so press out of Brattleboro. Um, a percentage of proceeds from everything they sell goes to 350.org, which is sort of nice. So you can buy it and kind of feel good about it. Um, I'll be doing a couple of local readings November 5th, which is a Wednesday at 5 o'clock at uh, Broadside, November 7th at, uh, in Greenfield, which is a Friday night at 6 up at World Eye. Um, if you do decide to buy, really I'm encouraging people to support their local independent bookstore, like Broadside or World Eye. And while it's available on Amazon, trying to get people not to pick it up at Amazon, um, but again, to support our local businesses. Thank you very much. So, um, responses or questions for the readers? I'm going to start because I've been thinking about, I just read Peter's book. And one thing that was very striking to me about um, BJ, this wild character, um, with the questions about his sexuality, you know? I, um, so I guess he, you know, I, I'm a lesbian who came out it's sort of in that period, and I have a very strong sense of what it might mean to be a closeted gay man, which seems like he might have been. Do you think yeah. that's right? Yeah? And, so that raised all sorts of, well, I guess I'm kind of going about the backwards, but the, the first question I guess I have, do you, do you have a sense of why in the world a wealthy, famous, powerful academic would take the risk of making psychedelic drugs in his lab? Why do you have, do you have a feeling for why you think he did that? Well, that's, Uh, their subjects. And I know that he, 
almost perfectly the, the profile for a psychopath, mm -hmm. someone with uh, narcissistic personality disorder. Um, they're, they're not all killers, um, obviously. Uh, some of them But they're risk takers. Um, they're, they're risk takers in the sense that they're uh, often so much in a bubble that they're oblivious to the potential consequences of their actions. They're uh, uncaring about what happens to other people. Uh, total lack of empathy. I think he Yeah, was it because he lost a big grant from the National Science Foundation? He was outraged yeah. by that and in his mind could justify doing almost anything. Felt invulnerable by his position. Uh, he bought the precursors to acid and quaaludes openly, some of the crew the university. And very thin cover story would uh, fool everyone. It's interesting that you brought up his um, moon death because just before that, his uh, long time wife had died and she <laughs> kept him on a leash. He'd always been pretty outrageous, but I think, and he probably to a certain degree liked being on him that leash, and once, but once that leash was off, uh, anything goes, you know, he, psychopaths uh, lack a basic sense of morality, or morality doesn't apply to them, common morality, the herd morality, and he just thought he could get away, and it might just be a pretty cool idea. Yeah, I mean, you know, it is, and, and my sort of, like, my novel is my sort of working on it, and I was just like, oh, it's that, he, like, the way he dressed and all the rest of it, like, this desire to be cool seems so, so compelling to him, and I, I thought, oh, but he was also, he wasn't openly gay, right? So I, it, I sort of, he, you know, okay, drugs is a substitute for open sexuality, and it, I don't know. I, there's, I mean, it's it's sort of there's no way to know, but it it's 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 certainly a very compelling question. Um, other people, yeah, Dana. It did seem like there was a parallel with the people who did the chips. What was the name of the movie? No, but no, but there's the guy with the chips who was saying period. The, the people who brought up the single chip, um, there was a movie about, you remember, that they brought him up as a child in their household, the same wanting to be cool, um, all, all the same features under the skin. There's quite a, a big movie just came out. We are all doing the same Huh? Is it where are all the people doing the same thing? It could be, but it was, it's, it's, it's they brought them into that. It's not like a book or anything. Well, it's quite an interesting movie. <laughs> they have all this footage with, the, child, the baby children playing with the baby chimp, oh, yeah. and as the chimp becomes bigger and bigger, is less agreeable. The people start doing more and more outrageous things to maintain this cool thing, having the students taking them, the chimp in, a lot of dangerous and sexual situations with the chimp. Anyway, so it sounded... I, I mean, you know, I might be able to, to dig up the name of this movie for you because it's real footage and it sounds like it could be, these guys could be part of it. Carolyn. This is a comment, and, and you could comment on my comment where you're actually. Okay. The way you're describing BJ, to me, some of the things you're saying. It could describe humans as a collective and our attitude toward the planet and toward insects. You know, like we're just focused on ourselves and what we can get for ourselves, and we totally disregard any impact on 
insects or the species going extinct or, you know, we, uh, like as you were talking, I was thinking about like just filling the word human as a collective, not necessarily individual people right. and things. Like, right. and that's partly why everything is, well, I'm saying I think, is that why everything's kind of tipped on the balance, losing everything up, not paying attention to our connection, just moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and another interesting thing about BJ was um, a lot of people thought of him as a liberal or progressive, certainly when he was in the South. Uh, his best friend, Peter Klopfer, uh, was very involved in the civil rights movement, and BJ was a huge supporter of uh, civil rights, and later, uh, you know, opposed to the war in Vietnam. And a lot of people gave him credit for that, and I just began to feel that even that was an act, and uh, it was just cool uh, to hold the Southern uh, rednecks in contempt for their backward ideas about uh, race, and it was, uh, I'm using the term rednecks the way he would use it. Uh, he thought it was cool to be against the war in Vietnam, because it was cool to be anti-authority. Um, so he just adopted his ideas for the sheer coolness factor and to make himself look better. I do think he was a psychopath, and they are the extreme. We all live in our own worlds, and we should be more concerned about um, species extinctions and uh, climate change, and yet, you know, we have to go through the day. Um, it would be great if uh, we could maybe, you know, have a bigger dose of OCD. <laughs> um, you know, the psychopaths, there, there's a book called The Psychopath Test, uh, written by great um, journalist John Watson. It's kind of funny, but it's interesting. And uh, a lot of people who have studied psychopaths see it as kind of a spectrum. Uh, with one side being you have a lot of empathy and the psychopath zero empathy, and most people fall somewhere between those extremes. Um, you know, if we could all have a little more empathy, uh, if we just stop for a moment and go, you know, this climate change stuff can't go on. Fortunately, I think we are mostly in the middle. Certainly nice to be more empathetic, that's, that's for sure. I mean, the BJ, I read Peter's book, it's a wonderful book, and he was a psychopath. He was zero on the empathy scale. But he loved his lemurs. Yes. Um, it's a weird kind of juxtaposition of uh, really not liking people, but loving wildlife. So it's weird. It's a weird book. Sounds <laughs> 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 very well. There was a question in the back, yeah. Yeah, and this is really for everybody, uh, for the top three um, writers, because it's kind of a writing question. It follows a little bit on what you've been discussing, and that is like how complex all these things are. And as a writer, how do you make the topics accessible, funny, um, and still incorporate the nuances and the complexities and the, the things that we have to grapple with Thank you. 
And well, mine is a pretty much of a confusing mess. So, um, uh, I don't know what the answer. I think a, a, a critique of my novel could be that's pretty didactic. It's a rant, and, uh, and I use the the, um, uh, the the character to really talk about issues that I'm really concerned with. And, and to me, it's really pretty black and white. There are some gray areas here. There's right or wrong. It's Satan uh, versus God. It's good versus evil. It's right versus wrong. It's really pretty simple. Um, I'm writing another one now, and I'm trying to do it as a young adult novel about a young girl in um, West Virginia in now in 2014. And it's sort of a coming of age novel. And she's coming of age, uh, not just coming of age, but coming of age to activism. How do people get active? And I'm really interested in that. And she lives in a town where there is mountaintop removal going on. And I think a lot of us have heard of that. Excuse my language, but it's probably the biggest clusterfuck out there. I mean, you know, we're, we are literally going in, blowing up mountains in the most diverse section of the country, which is Appalachia. Um, we are extracting huge amounts of wealth from the most impoverished region of the country, which is Appalachia. Literally blowing up mountains, 500 so far, to get an hour or two of energy for the United States to burn the coal to fry the planet. I mean, what could be worse? And how can you make a comedy out of that? But who's going to read a novel where it's just so depressing? So the only thing I can find, you know, it's like what Popeye said, I am what I am. I mean, I've got sort of adolescent, immature uh, humor, which is what I'm able to use. And, um, and theoretically, people can read that and laugh at that, but also get at the, at the bigger issues. If I could just comment, I, you know, the time has come for environmentalists to lighten up. And that's why uh, I think your, your concept is such a great idea. Uh, too often, you know, and I'm talking about myself here, I, you know, if I go on a rant about climate change, and we were both at the march, uh, sometimes you just end up making people feel bad. Um, even if you're not being self-righteous, uh, people start going, oh, God, yeah, I'm not recycling enough. I did throw this uh, Diet Coke bottle in the, gar out the regular garbage, and, uh, you know, you're making me feel bad. Um, at least, you know, using some humor is, is a, a way to uh, get in. And, and make a case without being scolded. Or, uh, I look forward to reading your book. I haven't uh, read it yet, but um, ranting is fine. I love to rant, but if you can inject a little humor in your rant, that mm -hmm. the ranting is more effective, isn't it? I'm sure that's your goal. Faith, do you have a response yeah, to that? Well, you know, people rant about bugs, as they call them, and insects all the time, and I feel that one of my roles as a scientist, as an entomologist, as a humanist, is to bring insects to people and help them get over some of those fears, those worries, those um, big kind of negative yucks, and I think there's a word here that's coming to me, one of my favorite words, and the word is uh, biophilia, um, coined by a great scientist, E.O. Wilson. And Wilson said that because humans evolved with all other life on the planet, we all carry within us a love, the philia, of bio, of life. And whether I'm working with adults when I'm teaching science or children, I try to bring up that word. It's a very, very good word. And I think we're kind of all talking about that, about biophilia. So I guess that's, that's my comment. It's a very good word. He He's a wonderful he writer. He He's an amazing writer. Else. Yeah. So, yeah.
It did come up in your fiction. It, it did. Um, you know, in my opinion, there are drugs and there are drugs. And uh, I think there's sort of an innate desire by humans to alter states of reality. And there are horrible drugs out there. And, and uh, you know, quaaludes, I think, is one, and heroin, and you know, crystal meth, and, uh, and crack, and, and those kinds of things. And I think the worst drug is alcohol in terms of. Uh, potential for addiction and violence and domestic abuse. Um, cigarettes as a nicotine. We have a writer in our audience here about how to quit cigarettes, which is uh, more people die from cigarettes than any other drug. And then there's pot, and I think, I'm not saying it's, it's good or bad, but certainly the climate is changing around pot. Um, with legalization efforts now in two states, it's legal, and we've really decriminalized it. And, Medicinal marijuana is coming up soon. I think we'll be voting in 2016 whether to legalize or not. You know, the war on drugs was a failure. It is a failure. And we're an incarceration nation here. How many people are in jail? You know, we have more people in the, in the prison system in this country than, you know, about to combine countries in the entire world. Most of them are nonviolent drug offenses. A lot are people of color for, you know, having a joint or two. I mean, it's, just, it's just outrageous. Um, that's a rant. That really has nothing to do with my book, but uh, I'm not quite sure what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're calling for the change or even Yeah. Yeah, there is one. Let me do one, one more thing. It's really interesting. Uh, of course, illegal marijuana is a huge business here. And I read, I read off the internet, so it has to be true, that uh, I think 1% of electricity in the country goes to growing indoor marijuana. And it's so inefficient. And people, I mean, it's just amazing how, one, how much has grown, and two, how inefficient the system is. Um, because you're trying to do it illegally and you know, work off old engines and all. Uh, I work at uh, Greenville Community College. We have a wonderful, beautiful new passive solar greenhouse. 
and I proposed to the president that we, uh, that we get in on the medicinal marijuana thing. <laughs> We could demonstrate and do it in an efficient, organic, sustainable way, and that idea really is not going anywhere. <laughs> I, I see your question now. I, I'm going to ask one thing since we're talking about drugs of faith. So the, the lax scale was used to make can, the capsules for drugs, right? Um, it's used to um, coat capsules so that when you're taking something that you don't want to digest right away. So slow release kind of medicines. It goes into the stomach and the outer shellac is just stopping that drug from dissolving. It's very, very slow. Release. And you may not have a sense of this, but I'm going to ask you in case you do. Do you have a sense about whether, you know, products from insects as opposed to synthetic products are, are better for the environment in general? Is that a, a generalization one can make or no? Uh, I guess I think that many products, whatever they are, are probably better for human beings if they come from the environment rather than being manufactured from various kinds of chemicals. The use of insect products um, throughout history is pretty amazing and, and why one of the ways that shellac was used um, it was used for a lot of things. It was used for menstrual problems. It was used for um, various stomach problems. Because of the waxiness and the ability to coagulate, it was used by veterinarians to um, put inside the hooves of, of cattle and horses. It was used to hold broken bones of humans together. So really wide ranging from that um, ability to, to harm up and, and so I've got like three questions. There was Nyla, and then someone over here, and someone here. So, yeah. Nyla. Uh, I didn't really have a question. I just wanted to, 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 to say that um, I, I really appreciated your talks and the way that they, they wound into one another. I think it's, it's really amazing to hear. We hear a lot of, a lot of fiction here. I mean, we hear all sorts of great stuff here, honestly. But, uh, nice to get this real connection to the real world and also in each of your talks to the natural world. So I really appreciated that. I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, thank you. I think um, uh, on my part, it was in no way intended. And I would say most of the time, I would go to Susan for planning this evening and bringing it together. And Lisa, right? <laughs> And how it's sort of back to you know sort of guilt and we're all going to die and this is catastrophe and you know um, sort of the the, the 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 gloom and doom approach and I don't think I ever was that um, but it also said this article that you can't just um, say well the government's going to solve all of our problems so we really don't have to do anything ourselves let's just turn it over to the federal government because nothing we do makes a difference it's all about you know, we have to have a carbon tax, or we have to, to, to do this or, or do that. So uh, in reading that and, and, and doing some of the research for my book, really trying, it has changed how I teach. Um, 
in terms of, uh, of being optimistic, of being hopeful, of being realistic, uh, of acknowledging that there is huge potential for catastrophe here, but that there are things we can do uh, as individual citizens that we can, and one of them is to vote, uh, and that there are huge uh, resources available at the local level, the state level, the government level, um, uh, to, give, to give people hope. One, to, to do things themselves, two, to band together and do things collectively. So yeah, it, 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 has, it has changed. That reminds me of, of something that John Crowley said. He's a great novelist who spoke in this series. And he feels this wave of dystopian fiction. Um, in, in the face of that, he feels an obligation to try to write utopian fiction that writers should exercise their imaginations um, towards the possibility of positive change. So yeah. cool. Can I make one quick comment? Sure, that? but I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, I know we're all done. Real quick. Yeah. So, you know, people read The Hunger Games. And I love the first one, and the second and the third just descend into this violent chaos. And I thought she had such an opportunity. She's a great writer. And, and, and the books you know, were really good in so many levels. But I was so pissed off at her at the end. I thought she had this wonderful opportunity to too. present a utopian vision other than just, well, I won't give away what happens to me. But <laughs> <laughs> I just did. So, um, and, and it just pissed me off that, uh, you know, where was the vision? Yeah. Yes. I want to, first of all, thank all three. I loved all three presentations. But I wanted to just dovetail on something Peter said about people thinking in terms of narcissism and antisocial person or sociopathy as a spectrum. Not that they're the same, but a, a, a continuum. So when you, you mentioned that at one point, you know, there are CEOs, you know, running corporations, they're more likely to be narcissists and then there are, and I think most of us have no narcissists, but few of us may know on that spectrum malignant narcissists, people who kind of have some antisocial traits with their narcissism, and then the true sociopaths, and Surprisingly, there are more of them around than we might think. And they, one of the things they're very skilled at doing is eliciting sympathy and the sense that they are victims. And so that you're drawn to want to help them. And so when you said one friend, they're geniuses. They're geniuses of that. So you said some one friend with a Quaker stayed with them right. as a friend, but you also spoke of other people who kind of still believe he was framed. And yeah. that's pretty typical. He probably was not framed. He um, was not. Right, but they're yet, yet still, despite this horror of trying to poison people, there are those who kind of can't quite believe it because of how skilled someone like that is. Yeah, they're brilliant at manipulating. disturbing that they can, um, it, it's almost like someone has the ability to change reality in, in a room, you know, just by uh, force of personality. Uh, so we're out of time. Thank you so much and thanks to the speakers, Faith Deering, Peter Koble, and Brian Adams. Don't forget about Brian's signing sheet. If you're interested in his book, he's got a sign-in sheet. Do you have it with you? Is that where it is? I do. Yeah, so he's got, if you want to be on his mailing list. And there's refreshments in the back of the room.